people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this per tweet from The Boxing Waffle. Franchon Cruz Desern is set to defend her undisputed super middleweight titles against Hannah Gabriels in March. Gabriels is the current WBA light heavyweight and WBC heavyweight champion, having already been a champion at junior middleweight for some years. She's a three-division champion overall, technically she is. She won the light heavyweight and heavyweight titles in a single contest, a single match, though all the same, she does hold titles at both weights. She's going to be moving down in weight for this fight. Down to super middleweight. Middleweight, where Franchon Cruz currently reigns as that division's undisputed champion, the authority at 168 pounds. They share a common opponent in Clarissa Shields. Now they're going to be taking on each other. This was actually one of the fights I recommended when plotting the next course of action for Franchon Cruz after having become the super middleweight division's undisputed champion earlier this year opposite the ring, Aline Cedar Ruse, the only other unified champion at super middleweight at the time on the undercard of Taylor versus Serrano. An excellent fight, and this fight promises to be an excellent fight as well. I'm glad they're doing it. Moreover, I'm glad that Hannah's not wasting her talents up there at light heavyweight and heavyweight. What are barren weight classes in the sport of women's boxing? There's nobody up there for her to fight. Nobody with a profile. Hannah Gabriel sports a professional record of 21 wins with two losses, one draw, 12 knockouts, having only ever been knocked out once. Just once, some years ago, by the Dominican Republic. Public zone, Oxandia Castillo. They had two fights between them. Oxandia won the first one, and Hannah won the second. She's going to be taking on Franchon Cruz now, who's some years younger and certainly a bit more active than Hannah Gabriel's has been in the last 12 months, two years, really. Franchon sports professional record eight wins with one loss, no draws, two knockouts, just two knockouts. And there's more to boxing than what you see on paper. Franchon may have less recorded knockouts than Hannah Gabriel's, but for my money, I think she's a stronger puncher than Hannah. Many of those knockouts that Hannah Gabriel's racked up, she racked up down there at junior middleweight. She spent some time there before eventually moving up to light heavyweight. She's moving down now to super middleweight. What I think will be a better weight for her, better weight for her career, and a better weight overall. Hannah Gabriel's, she's not a tall woman with a big frame. In terms of height, she's actually shorter than French on Cruz, albeit campaigning at a much heavier weight than Franchon. They're meeting up at 168 pounds. What do I think about this fight? Well, as stated, it's a good fight. It's a very good fight. Promises to be an all-action shootout. Hannah Gabriels, she's a mid-range to inside fighter with good feet. Very bouncy. So you have to question how those feet and how those legs are going to look. Hannah Gabriels having fought only once, just once in the last two or three years, two or three years or so. She sat out all of 2020. She fought once in 2021. Didn't fight at all this year. That's a drawback. That's a problem. You're approaching an undisputed title fight with the super middleweight division's undisputed champion, and you've only fought once in the last three years, and the night of the fight, it will have been well over a year since you last saw action. Well over a year. It's one month shy of two years. It's one month shy of a two-year stint of inactivity. Hannah last saw action in April of last year. Set to return in March of next year opposite the ring French on Cruz who fought once in 2020, once last year, and once this year. She has comparatively kept a more steady schedule of activity year by year than Hannah has, unless we forget Franchon is some years younger than Hannah Gabriel, so she's a fresher fighter with less ring rust to have to shake off. As a professional, Hannah Gabriel's may be more experienced than Franchon Cruz. She certainly has been around a lot longer, more rounds in the bank, fought in more fights. She might have, but she's also older and less active. That is what's working against her. And Franchon Cruz is a physical fighter, a mid-range to inside 
pressure fighter. The physical fights don't tend to favor the older fighter. They expose their age and their overall condition and their inexorable decline. Father Time, he catches up to us all. We might see him catch up to Hannah Gabriel's opposite the ring, French on Cruz, who I'm giving the edge in this thing. It's just the way it is. Hannah Gabriel's really has been one of the better fighters anywhere at or around these weights. But under these circumstances, you have to give French on the edge. Curious as to where the card will take place, on what platform, under what promotional banner. I can only assume that this is going to be part of a DAZN show. Might be, might not be. These days, you never know. But Franchon's last fight was part of a matchroom show, and she did enter into a promotional deal with them ahead of the Aline Cedarouz fight, so it is safe to assume that it might be a matchroom show. We'll see. Set to go down in March. Looking forward to that. It's nice to see that Hannah Gabriel's decided to answer the call and fight an irrelevant fight, what is one of the more relevant fights any one of these fighters can hope to have anywhere at or around these weights i say it all the time they cannot afford to stay away from each other the good fighters the really good fighters at or around these weights because the talent pool isn't deep enough for them to keep busy with someone else they have to face each other and that's what they're going to do in march of next year keep your eyes peeled for that as more information becomes available Man, super bantamweight news. Unified WBA and IBF super bantamweight champion Murjan Akhmadaliev has arrived back in the United States to begin his training camp for mandatory challenger Marlon Topalez. The IBF have scheduled purse bids for December 20th, and in all likelihood, a purse bid won't be necessary. Marlon Topalez is not with any of the major promotional outfits here in the U.S. of A. that might pose a problem in this situation, at least not to my knowledge, whereas Murajan, he is a matchroom fighter fighting exclusively on his own, supposed to take on Marlon. Experienced guy, been around the block a few times, sport professional record at 36 wins, three losses with no draws, 19 knockouts, having been knocked out two times. Is it my imagination or are the sanctioning bodies, the powers that be, always weighing Murajan Akhmadaliev down with mandatories. I believe that his last fight was a mandated title fight. It is true that Murajan Akhmadaliev's last fight, like this fight, was a mandated title fight, a mandated title defense, but that defense was by way of the WBA. This mandated title defense is by way of the IBF. Murajan, who sports a professional record of just 11 wins with no losses, no draws, and eight knockouts. He only fought once this year. That was the Ronnie Rios fight. And he hurt his hand in that fight, so he was unable to return to action this year to at least get in two fights instead of just one and before he even gets to return to action here come the powers that be with yet another mandatory challenger it does seem like the alphabets order his mandatories a lot more frequently than they do for some other fighters some other champions that are with champions that are with other outfits other promoters and other platforms nevertheless Murjan Akhmadaliev has more or less kept a steady schedule of activity. He fought once, only once, in 2020 before the pandemic shut everything down. He fought two times last year, only once this year, back in June, opposite the ring, Ronnie Rios. Had he not been injured, do you think he would have got the chance to fight Stefan Fulton? I'll be honest with you. Even if Murajan Akhmadaliev weren't injured, I wasn't holding my breath to see those two champions, those two super bantamweight unified champions, share the ring with each other due to the politics of boxing, in spite of what either one of them, Stefan mostly. Irrespective of what Stefan may say on camera. There's been talks of uh, Inouye, there's been talks of MJ. Uh, how do you want those fights to line up? I want to be undisputed. And then the other fight for this is stuff in time. Here. Now, are you willing to travel to the to Japan yeah, to make that fight happen? Yeah, all action, all the smoke. Yeah, okay. I like it. What he says to an interviewer, what you read in an article, he's a Heyman fighter, he's a PBC guy. Do you think he was going to cross over to the zone for that fight? And if you're telling yourself, well, why should Stefan be the one that crosses over? Okay, let's say he doesn't cross over. Do you think that Stefan was going to make Murajan Akhmadaliev an offer to come over to his side of things to do the fight there? No, I don't. If I'm being honest. And as of late, it felt like Stefan Fulton was spending a lot more time focusing on a guy who's south of the super bantamweight division at bantamweight, Naoya Inoue, who's becoming more and more popular in the West. He's already a big draw in the Far East, the land of the rising sun, his native, Japan. And his notoriety is 
growing. Lately, Stefan has spent more time talking about that guy than talking about a Mutajan Akhmedaliev undisputed super bantamweight title fight, and it's disappointing because it would have been a great fight, could have been a great fight. Stefan, after talking all that big talk, he's set to leave the super bantamweight division to move up to featherweight to take on Brandon Figueroa for a second time, and not for a full title, not for a full title, an interim title. We'll see how that works out, though. If he wins, I don't expect that he will return. Return to Super Bantamweight, and if he loses, if he loses up there, well, I don't expect that he'll return in a timely fashion. So now the news at Super Bantamweight is that Murajan Akhmadaliev is going to be taking on Tapales, his next mandatory challenger, and there is an added incentive for him to make it through it. And he knew he fight is right around the corner. It's only a matter of time before that guy moves up to 122 pounds, and when he gets there, he's gonna want to fight a champion. It may turn out that Murajan is the only champion available, the only champion there for him to fight. And I've said this many times, I don't think Matchroom and DAZN would stand in the way of that fight. They didn't stand in the way of Baumgartner versus Mayer. They let Alicia go over there to Sky Sports and Boxer. More recently, they let John Ryder go over there to BT Sport in Queensbury for the Zach Parker fight. If push comes to shove, I think they'd let Murajan go to Japan for the Inui fight. Hell, I think they'd let him go to top rank if it were here in the United States. If that's what it takes, I don't get the sense they'd stand in the way of what would be Murajan's biggest opportunity to fight the major fight. A significant one with a pound for pound fighter. One who's buzzing right now and one who has more of a profile than either Murajan or Stefan Fulton. A fight between Murajan and Inui has more of a profile than a fight with Murajan and Stefan. It's reality. And while I could go for either fight, MJ versus Fulton or MJ versus Inui or Inui versus Fulton, we ain't got no time for the time wasters. And you're wasting your time talking about an Inui versus Fulton fight or a Fulton versus Akhmedalia fight. None of that shit is gonna happen. Anything involving Stefan Fulton is exclusive to PBC, PBC Island, and PBC Fighters. He's not gonna fight either one of those guys. It's a pipe dream. He's gonna fight Brandon Figueroa for a second time at a weight that's a lot better for Brandon Figueroa than it is for Stefan Fulton. Brandon was very big, always very big, for 122 pounds. He'll be bigger and stronger at 126. And even if Stefan Fulton makes it through that fight, makes it through that rematch, who's gonna notice? Who's gonna care? Nobody was asking for this. Spent all that time talking about what he would do to Noya Inoue. He'd wash him or whatever he said so that he could end up fighting Brandon Figueroa for a second time. Inui versus Akhmedaliev is the fight, provided that Murijan Akhmedaliev can make it past Tapales, and he should be able to. Let's hope he does. Finally, men's lightweight news. Ryan Gersha took to his social media and stated, been thinking about it during the time they were figuring out this fight, and I feel the fans and everyone who supports boxing have seen these tune-ups already. It's time that we give the fans what they want. Also, he requested the tune-up, not me. So let him handle business. Let's go. To which a Twitter user that goes by the name Michael replied, hmm, hmm. the Hesta fight canceled? To which Ryan Garcia responded, never was a contract. Just talked about. I was deciding if I needed a fight before. Javante Davis's last fight was in May of this year, whereas Ryan's fight was a little later, two months later in July. If the schedule stays on track and Javante Davis had not scheduled this upcoming Hector Garcia fight, it may have been at least a year's time since he saw action between his last fight earlier this year and the upcoming Ryan Garcia fight that's supposed to take place in the second quarter of next year. So it makes sense that he would have wanted a tune-up fight in between. He only fought once this year, and that was some months ago. I think it would have behooved Ryan to have a tune-up fight as well ahead of what's supposed to be that Javante Davis showdown, but Ryan is saying, fuck the tune-up, bring on Tank, sparking him out in two, two, just two rounds. It would be some achievement if Ryan Garcia managed to do this, even if Javante Davis isn't the number one lightweight or super lightweight in the world, he is a popular little butterball. Paranoid one as well, he's still propagating that conspiracy theory that Ryan Garcia is on the sauce, retweeting Mr. Boxing Guru's tweet, which reads, Someone is cycling off the juice, so they are skipping on the quote-unquote tune-up. Huh, Javante was right, to which Javante Davis responded, LOL, tagging Ryan Garcia and saying, What's going on? And like clockwork, Javante Davis's cult of fans 
go along with whatever he says, whatever baseless accusations he makes, even if there isn't a shred of evidence associated with them. In today's boxing landscape of offenders and repeat offenders, nothing would really surprise me. I don't rule out the possibility that Ryan Garcia is on the sauce, that he might be on a performance-enhancing drug, but I feel that way about most every boxer, including Javante Davis. As far as I know, they could all be on something, and they're all playing innocent until they get caught. But you know, it was Gervonta Davis that started this rumor some weeks ago after their fight was quite unofficially announced, a fight that isn't even signed yet. Better still, it was Gervonta Davis that got the ball rolling for all of this based on some images of Ryan Garcia's physique, the musculature, the definition, the kind that he doesn't have between fights. People tend to forget that Ryan Garcia is several years younger than Gervonta Davis, even if he's already bigger and his body is still growing. Whereas Gervonta is a shorter, stumpier fighter whose weight in between fights seems to go directly to his gut. Between fights, he's rather soft in the body, perhaps some indication of his habits, what bad habits he has. He's the kind of fighter that doesn't necessarily stay in shape between fights and doesn't get in shape until he has a fight. So maybe Ryan's more of a gym rat than Gervonta, relatively speaking, comparatively. Maybe he stays in shape a little bit more than Gervonta does between fights and tack on that he's a taller guy whose body is still growing. He's going to have more definition than a Gervonta Davis. He might. That kid's shaped like a loaf of bread. Between fights, he is. Oscar De La Hoya reacted to Ryan Garcia's skipping tune-up fight with Mercito Hesta. Calling the move ballsy, but admits it would have been wise for him to take it to stay sharp for Gervonta. Reiterating what I told you here on this channel some weeks ago, that the contracts are not signed for Ryan Garcia versus Gervonta Davis. And if the contracts aren't signed, there's still time for the very skeptical and paranoid Gervonta Davis to incorporate VADA testing. If you're that worried about it, you say it's your show. You say you're the A-side. So if you're losing sleep over it, you're still talking about this weeks later, just incorporate VADA testing into the contract to allay any fears that Ryan Garcia may be on something ahead of what is to be their fight. Because I'll tell you something, if the fight don't materialize, if the fight don't happen, and you got all these people's hopes up. What, are you looking for a way out? Javante never accused Ryan Garcia of using pads in the past. He waits good up until he's supposed to fight him to start up with this stuff. What, are you looking for a way out? I mean, seriously, you wait good up until you're supposed to fight this guy in the second quarter of next year to get your magnifying glass out and get suspicious of everything. And everyone, if it bothers you that much, incorporate Vada testing into the contract Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Be a poor showing for Javante if the fight don't happen based on these accusations. Even worse for Showtime because they need the content. They need to deliver this fight. This entire calendar year, they haven't put on a big fight. They've had few decent scraps, some decent shows, but nothing major, nothing big, certainly nothing as big as this. Nothing as big as the Canelo versus Plant undisputed super middleweight title fight the year before. This entire calendar year. It's been abysmal and they need this fight to happen.